Hi, my name is Andre Workington, and today I will be talking about status compliance on small and cheap ARM based single board computers, such as the Raspberry Pi 4. I'm a software engineer at VMware, and I'm the tech lead for the ESXi ARM project in the Cloud Platform Business Unit, where we have importing the ESXi hypervisor, also known as vSphere, to 64 bit ARM platforms. One of the use cases for Virtualizing ARM is in virtualizing the far edge, which includes IoT gateways and universal customer premise equipment. I have been working on ARM-based technology for around 10 years, and I have been working on UEFI firmware off and on for about 14. I'm a member of the ARM Innovator Program. My focus is infrastructure. ARM also is one of the stakeholders in this UEFI for Raspberry Pi project. First, we will talk about standard compliance on servers, what these standards are, what they mean. Talk about single board computers and some of the challenges seen there and how uh, one could go about uh, making the Raspberry Pi standards compliant if that's even possible. Uh, do a demo and close with a call to action. Now, what is ARM server ready? It is what makes ARM servers possible. Uh, both competitive and compatible with the rest of the world, which is, of course, x86-based systems. Server-ready is a blueprint for how you create just works ARM-based infrastructure. Server-ready means adopting existing industry standards around booting, around uh, PCI Express, around all of these aspects of how you build a server, not because they're the best uh, way of going about something, but because it's what the industry generally has decided on. There is a hardware specification called Server-Based System Architecture, SBSA, that tells you how to wire up a, a, a machine such, as, such that it is a, an ARM server-ready compatible server. And there's a boot specification that tells you how to write your firmware, how to hand off state from firmware to OS, and how to boot an operating system. And of course, there's other specifications around management, security. There's an architectural compliance suite so you can test it to make sure that uh, you can be certified. Now, server ready is about making boring infrastructure. Uh, boring in a sense where I can buy an HPE or Dell server today and I don't have to ask myself whether it will run an operating system that I can also run on my laptop. So that's kind of the definition of boring. Boring means that I don't have to retrain my IT staff. Boring means that uh, you don't need any new skill sets in OEMs or ODMs to design uh, platform solutions around chips. Boring means that software developers um, can continue doing what it is they do best and they don't have to completely kind of uh, change the worldview. Uh, boring means that I can have uh, a single ISO of my favorite operating system. You know, maybe that's FreeBSD, maybe that's Windows. Uh, keep booting on any one of these machines, uh, at least now that I can load the right drivers. Yeah, right. Uh, so boring means a horizontally integrated ecosystem. And many in the BSD community will probably chuckle at the idea of standard compliance in ARM because for most of its life, ARM has been anything but compliant. Uh, ARM has been a staple of vertically integrated ecosystems. And what this means is that you have some company which rules their own hardware, which rules their own OS, supports the operating system, and rules the entire application stack, and then sells it to somebody. Uh, the only thing that that company might not do is make their own uh, system on a chip, their own processor. So that's something they will buy from another company. And that other company um, because they operate in this specific model, they will provide the board support package for the for that operating system, um, but they won't try very hard to create the chip. Uh, they'll know that any quirk they have in, in the hardware they can be worked around the software which they'll be providing to the integrator. Uh, they can integrate any crazy IP uh, with uh, any quirk, basically. Uh, in a horizontally integrated ecosystem, you know, things have to be much tidier, right? I, I should be able to replace Linux with BSD, Windows with ESX. Um, I can re replace one ODM with another and I ideally even move across different um, CPU vendors uh, without uh, 
even knowing that I, I, I did something special. Again, just like in X86 today. So the server-based system architecture is the, is the spec that guides how uh, hardware is built. Um, it consists of multiple levels. Um, new levels are added as the architecture evolves. And this means including and refining previous levels. Currently, we are at level six. Uh, so what does it standardize on? It standardizes on UARTs, interrupt controllers, IOMMU, how PCI Express is wired up, uh, how you could add uh, custom peripherals like SATA and, and USB, uh, what's the right way of doing uh, so. Here's an example. Uh, PCI Express, of course, is cache coherent. Of course, it has to work using eCAM like an x86. You don't need a, a crazy driver. Of course, by the way, you don't have to configure links. So all, all the programming is done by firmware. All the OS has to do is just use it. Uh, there's only one kind of an I.O. menu allowed. There's only one kind of interrupt controller. Only one way to do MSI. Only one way to do timers. Only one way to do watchdogs. And so on and so on. Uh, a large portion uh, is devoted not just to system level requirements, but to the processor requirements around, you know, if you're going to build a, a server CPU, uh, what should you have? How, how large should the VMIDs be, right? Should you have RAS facilities and what those are? How do the uh, performance monitoring uh, counters work? So the server-based booting requirement is a firm spec. This one adopts UEFI and ACPI from x86 world because that's what these modern servers are built with. Of course, not everything can be adopted. There are ARM-specific interfaces, right? Um, a good example of this is uh, the power state coordination interface, which is the way by which an operating system can enable a secondary processor in a generic fashion or, or disable it. Uh, this is implemented on top of uh, as a bad analogy, uh, uh, some kind of analog of uh, uh, system management mode, right, called Trustzone. It's, it's not exactly apples to apples, but it's a pretty good comparison for those of you who might not uh, uh, be necessarily kind of always working on ARM. Okay, so I've talked about servers. Uh, but uh, all those non-server non devices uh, have always been non-compliant. Even the higher-end devices from some vendors are basically treated as high-end embedded. Um, silicon providers shipping their own versions of Ubuntu, uh, not upstreaming uh, kernel changes or not doing so fast enough and then kind of dropping off by the time they release a new board, uh, you know, the support for the old board never got fully integrated, right? Doing custom firmware, and that means, uh, um, it's not even, sometimes not even U-boot, or when they integrate something like U-boot, uh, it's like, there's no video, there's no USB support, uh, it's kind of hard to use. Um, so basically nothing off the shelf, tons of vendor lock-in, um, basically poor support after a few years. Uh, and, uh, you know, this whole class of systems uh, seems like it's well positioned for kind of this new wave of IoT, edge compute, AI, machine learning, but then there's no common ecosystem. Um, clearly, this is getting in the way of, of adoption and proliferation. Uh, is there light at the end of the tunnel? Uh, I think there is. Clearly, standards are not just for servers. On x86, they're not just for servers. We have laptops, servers. We've seen that some mobile devices built around x86 chips, right? And all of these uh, have one thing in common. Um, that is, the hardware looks consistent, more or less, to the OS. And what's not consistent is easily described by ACPI and uh, uses standardized firmware to boot. So clearly, this could be done on non-server class systems. And in fact, at the ARM TechCon 2019, ARM extended this idea that we're you have server ready available today that in some indeterminate future you could have related profiles for uh, client devices such as laptops, for edge devices such as IoT gateways, for smart mix, and all of these would maybe share like 90% of what goes into a server. Of course, there'll be differences simply because of uh, uh, the different kinds of use case or requirement. Like you can imagine um, 
low power mode is very and uh, kind of going to sleep and coming back is very important for a laptop but not so important for a server so at a high level this is happening this, this understanding that uh, it's not just servers that, that that stand to benefit from standardization many of you may have heard about ebbr uh, ebbr is the embedded boot, base boot requirements but this spec really standardize on the idea of using UE file-like firmware interfaces uh, to hand off to the, to the OS. It doesn't uh, tell you exactly, uh, first of all, how the system should be built. That is completely open. And it also doesn't um, uh, really describe uh, what that handoff state from uh, firmware to the OS is. So most likely it's going to be device straight, right? Uh, it can be a CPI, right? So a good example, a Raspberry Pi that uses uh, third-party U-Boot, um, that's EBBR, right? Uh, U-Boot uh, can run a UEFI uh, OS loader, like Grub, right? pass it the device tree, and OS can use it. Um, another example, which some may disagree, but uh, the OS connected to Windows PCs, uh, uh, which run Windows 10, like the HP Envy or Lenovo Yoga, those are also EBBR devices, except they use ACPI, they don't use device tree. Um, but they're not um, really SBSA, SBBR. In fact, you need a custom OS image um, to boot uh, on the laptop, Windows or Linux. Um, so that basically means it's still really that EBBR mode where you have to run an OS tailored to the hardware, even though you may have standardized on some portion of that boot flow. Okay, so what can we do about this? Um, well, why don't we take the most popular platform in the world that's ARM-based and try to make it uh, standards compliant? So that could be a Raspberry Pi 4. It's a high volume, low cost device, only 50 bucks. Uh, clearly usable by, by everybody. You can buy it anywhere. Uh, there are folks out there who haven't heard about ARM but have heard about the Raspberry Pi. Um, now, one of the advantages about uh, uh, targeting the Pi um, in, instead of some other board is that the Pi will be around, right? Um, and uh, there's a Pi 4, there'll probably be a Pi 5, and by the, by the time folks are using Pi 6, you'll still be able to use a Pi 1, right? So the Raspberry Pi Foundation uh, uh, has created a vertically integrated ecosystem, right? But uh, either because it, uh, it has some good approach about it or because they were the first there. They have created a vibrant ecosystem. Uh, I would say that uh, it's, it's a place where other SBC vendors can't really compete because they're not providing any value, right? So with a Raspberry Pi, you could be locked in to the software stack, right, and to the hardware, but at least you know you'll be able to use it in 10 years. Um, and you have a massive community of software and hardware hackers to kind of pull on. Well, all these other SBCs, well, yeah, there's like some half-baked support today and then two years is just a paperweight. So if somebody wants to compete with a Pi, I, I would suggest going and, and, and looking at making solutions which are interoperable, which are compatible, and, and which follow this, this idea of uh, uh, standards compliance. But in our case, since we're just starting to kind of get this ball rolling, Let's go for that for that uh, most popular board, and that's the Raspberry Pi 4. Now, is it feasible? You clearly could not do this with the Pi 3 because the Pi 3 didn't have a standardized interrupt controller. Now, the Pi 4 has a, a GIC V2 that's, uh, that, that's not part of, say, level 6 because level 6 already mandates GIC V3. But the Pi 4 only has four cores, so yeah, GIC V2. If you uh, cap uh, either compliance level, let's say two or three, it should still be at least compliant to that. Uh, it has USB, proper USB 3, uh, wired up using some fairly improper PCI Express, but uh, uh, we can pretty much ignore PCI Express uh, because there's no physical slot. You cannot plug in, um, well, you can solder, and we've seen that somebody actually did an acute hack. But for most of us, we're not going to be attaching our Melnox NICs to a, a, a Raspberry Pi 4. And so by that stretch, it doesn't matter if the OS sees um, uh, PCI Express or it doesn't. Uh, 
So as long as we can just expose the USB 3, if we can configure it and make it presentable, okay, great. Uh, if we were to do this project, how should we do it? Of course, we should do it out in the open. Um, it should be a true open source project. Of course, set an example and show others how it could be done. Now, there are folks in the audience who don't care about IoT, don't care about small board computers, and uh, might actually not really like the Raspberry Pi. Um, why would any of you care? Well, because there are no good client platforms today to build a good mass of developers. If I want folks to build for my Xeon A7, uh, they can do it on a $200 laptop. Um, if I want somebody to build for a Thunder X3 whenever that comes out, uh, what am I going to use? So maybe some of the cloud vendors have been partially solving this problem, but in general, uh, in order to build kind of real momentum, you, you need you need small devices in the hands of developers, something approachable. Uh, in the ARM server space, people have been lamenting the lack of approachable hardware. By approachable, I mean cheaper than 500 bucks. Um, so the Pi could do it, right? Um, I mean, it's not a server. That's kind of obvious. But you can do OS bring up. You can do some work on bootloaders, driver bring up, uh, um, and actually validate a lot of, or you know, clear out a lot of assumptions uh, in system software, right, around uh, supporting ARM or cleaning up uh, architecture dependencies. Uh, so why not? And if we had the uh, SBBR, SBSA, or something at least 90% of compliance, uh, you could boot Red Hat, you could boot you know, Windows. Um, that would be kind of cool, right? Red Hat obviously is a product today. You know, Windows um, uh, isn't commercially avail available unless you buy a, a Windows on, on ARM laptop. Uh, you could clearly boot uh, all those EBBR operating systems available today for Raspberry Pi, such as SUSE, Ubuntu, Debian, NetBSD, FreeBSD, OpenBSD. That's kind of cool. And um, clearly, you know, if you had an ACPI OS that was uh, uh, still tailored to the hardware, uh, a good example of this is NetBSD booting on the Raspberry Pi 3 in the UFI mode, then yeah, sure, uh, you could do that too. So, uh, you know, having these thoughts, um, we basically got this project going. Um, now, this project really is an evolution of the early work done on the Raspberry Pi 3. Uh, it all started way back when Microsoft released uh, the 32-bit UEFI sources for uh, Pi 2 and 3 as part of the Windows IoT core. Um, at the same time, uh, one of the Linaro developers, Ard, uh, published a very minimal 64-bit UEFI for the Raspberry Pi 3. And um, this is a very important step to even beginning with a 64-bit port. And the way it was done, it, it was kind of done correctly. It used this trusted firmware aspect for PSCI, so you could properly enable cores without using some weird mailbox hacks. And uh, I looked at these two things and got excited, and I thought it'd be great to kind of uh, mush it all together and get some drivers inside ARD's firmware. Um, it didn't end up being a walk in the park, but hey, uh, we got USB going. Uh, video, you know, SD uh, cards, and it, was, it started looking like a pretty usable system. It was capable of booting uh, SUSE Linux, Open SUSE, uh, which is pretty cool, of course, using device tree. And then folks started challenging uh, me to make Windows uh, bootable. Um, I thought it was completely impossible, but kind of one thing led to another, and we could show that, yeah, Windows was actually booting on the Raspberry Pi 3. Again, mostly courtesy of all the work that Microsoft has done to get Windows to boot on the Pi 2, and just that code stayed around in their 64-bit builds, but still. Um, then I actually demonstrated uh, ESXi running on the Raspberry Pi 3 at uh, one of our VMworld, uh, uh, VMware VMworld events. Um, and then uh, a, a gentleman by the name of P. Bartard uh, graciously uh, decided to upstream uh, this code, which just sat around GitHub, to upstream it to proper uh, Tiano core, which is the upstream for UEFI firmware. Tiano being Tiano EDK2 being Intel's reference implementation of UEFI. And uh, it was a pretty monumental effort. Uh, it was a ton of rewrites that happened along the way before um, the code was allowed to be merged in. Uh, but what, it, what, that's, what this meant is that by summer of 2019, um, anybody could go check out uh, the Tinocore UE5 and build it and run it on the Raspberry Pi 3. Uh, 
Now, this is where the Raspberry Pi 4 came out. And uh, between the VMware and ARM, I uh, was sort of talking about it, and we decided that, you know, it'd be cool to go and add Raspberry Pi 4 support with Pi 3 codebase. And why, why not try to make it standards compliant? And uh, one thing led to another, and uh, I demonstrated ESXi ARM at the ARM TechCon running in the Raspberry Pi 4. Um, ARM developers, including uh, Jeremy Linton, uh, did a number of contributions, uh, such as the UEFI driver for PCI Express, which meant we had working USB 3. Um, the first kind of official 1.0 um, uh, came out in December, and we could boot Linux and NetBSD. Uh, using a CPI with a working uh, with uh, with a working USB. Um, as of right now, we just we just got uh, native networking, uh, gigabit networking working inside UEFI, courtesy of uh, Jerry McNeil, who ported his NetBSD driver to UEFI. So now you can do HTTP HTTP boot. You do not need any USB dongles. It's it's very cool. So this Pi 4 firmware task force uh, right now comprises, it's all kind of volunteers. It's, uh, the project got started by uh, ARM and VMware, but it really is a community project. Um, there are developers from VMware, from ARM. Um, Pete has his own consulting company. And uh, Jared, of course, works on uh, NetBSD. Uh, everything we do, we do upstream. Uh, but of course, we have our own staging branches, uh, and these are available on, on GitHub as well. Everything is kept up to date with, uh, with, uh, with upstream. Now, the Pi 4 code is inherently a, uh, an evolution of Pi 3. There's a lot of commonalities, and so we really we, we do produce Pi 3 builds as well. So that's not standard compliant, of course, to SBSA and SBBR, but it's still useful for, for somebody, right? We have a bug tracker. Um, that uh, we uh, pretty actively use. Uh, we try to run those ACS test reports to see how far away we are from uh, standard, standards compliance uh, nirvana. Um, releases are available exactly where you see them on this link, and there's an official blog, rpi4-uefi.dev, where you have news, blog articles, that sort of thing. So here's an example of that blog. Uh, you can kind of read about uh, in a more uh, cohesive fashion about why why should we make the Pi be standards compliance, and you can look at the status reports and read about releases. Uh, actually, very sorry, very importantly, um, there's a link to our Discord channel, rpi 4 uefi dev This is on ARM's Discord uh, server, which is an ARM developer-oriented server. Uh, there's tons of topics, uh, uh, all ARM-centered, uh, but with very different um, focus areas. Uh, Pi, you know, Windows and ARM, w w works in ARM. You've got different uh, silicon vendors there. You've got ODMs. Uh, you can um, talk about microcontrollers, IoT, pretty much anything that involves ARM uh, is fair game on that, on that server. Okay, so what do we have today? Um, we have actually uh, quite a bit, a fairly reasonable system that somebody who is not a UEFI developer uh, could go and, and be uh, and do something interesting with it. Okay, so we support uh, both uh, UART devices, uh, we support a video console, uh, USB devices, including both the front ports and the Type C port, uh, which is a custom uh, USB controller. Support uh, um, removal media uh, using the SD host controllers. Uh, we emulate NVRAM. Uh, it's just file backed, uh, but with a file on on, on the SD card. Uh, we, we even have a random number generator. Of course, now we have a, a native UEFI uh, gigabit driver, which which I think is pretty amazing. Um, we implement trusted firmware, as of course a a uh, compliance system should. Um, this we implement operations to enable CPUs, disable CPUs, and of course reset and, and power off uh, the hardware. Uh, we do not uh, implement the NMI interface uh, yet. That's this SDEI, the software del uh, delegated uh, exception interface, and this is how you could implement uh, and proper NMIs on ARM, ARM hardware today, which don't support NMIs in, in hardware. 
some other cool things is uh, this is the only way by which you could do pixie booting on uh, on the Raspberry Pi uh, or use iSCSI uh, or boot using HTTP. Um, we use SMBIOS to communicate uh, sort of uh, inventory. Uh, of course, we have very early ACPI support, which today just describes USB and networking. And uh, we have eBBR compliance in the sense that we we just expose the device tree that the firmware that the VPU GPU firmware gives us, and this includes overlays. So for those of you familiar with using config.txt and DTBO files to match whatever um, Raspberry Pi hat, uh, all, all of that works, right? You can still do it. Now. The goal of this project is not to create uh, some kind of academic firmware which by throwing away 90% of, of the board functionality can kind of claim success. So today with ACPI, yes, we're only exposing USB um, and the networking. Actually, we're, we're also expo exporting the uh, SD host controller, at least one of them. But um, more devices should be should be possible. In fact, we, we we expose much more, but as far as OS support for those, you know, for example, in Linux, it's non-existent. No, nobody has done that work. Um, within NetBSD and OpenBSD today are probably the uh, the best operating systems in terms of support for the platform using ACPI bindings. Um, so some of the biggest challenges um, are. The, is in the way how USB is wired up. Due to a silicon bug, uh, the uh, PCI Express root complex can only address three gigabytes. Uh, well, the Raspberry Pi uh, comes in a four gigabyte flavor. Because of that, um, there needs to be a way by which the firmware can communicate to the operating system that um, it, it shouldn't use the full four gigabytes for DMA. Uh, fortunately, there is a way. Uh, Another interesting issue is that uh, what I would call the legacy devices. So these are devices that are shared with the Pi 3. These are the ones that are behind the, uh, the video core GPU. These have a one gigabyte DMA limit and they have a translation. So a translation means that the CPU addresses and the bus addresses aren't the same. Now, none of this violates the specifications, but nobody has done anything like that or talked about it. Um, so this this quite a bit of uh, impedance mismatch with sort of like, does any existing operating system support this um, that, that you know, is still server compliant? Okay, so there were two thoughts about exposing USB. One was, could we expose PC Express? And the short answer is no. Uh, wrong alignment, um, and uh, it's not cache coherent. Uh, and uh, if that's not enough, you can't actually scan uh, anywhere past uh, bus zero, device zero, function zero, uh, because there are other registers, unrelated registers following that. So you'll, you'll just read garbage uh, and or crash, kind of depending on what OS you're in. Uh, so that wasn't a great idea. Uh, what else could you do? Well, I mean, clearly you could virtualize, right? Um, but uh, of course, I work at VMware. I didn't want to have only EL1, that's kernel mode, available on, on the Raspberry Pi. Uh, I wanted to have something generic enough where you could still run a hypervisor and folks wanting to run KVM or, or Hyper-V, uh, why not, right? Okay, so we don't want to virtualize to high PCI Express quirks and we can't expose PCI Express directly. Um, well, like I mentioned, we don't actually need PCI Express because there's no physical slot. Could we just expose the, the, the USB? Yes, we can. So this idea is that the UEFI configures PCI Express. It assigns resources uh, to the base address registers for the PCI device. And then we make sure that the DSDT, the ACPI definition for the USB device, uh, just has the right addresses in it, right? Folks that are not familiar with ACPI, ACPI basically is like device tree, uh, if, and, except that it's written in a bytecode. And I, I'm not talking about the static tables, but the main the main uh, section of ACPI that talks about the hierarchical devices is a lot like device tree, except it's written in a bytecode and, er and everything you evaluate is basically a method. So you can do things at a runtime. 
Okay, some interesting challenge. Uh, UEFI actually disables bus mastering uh, on the way out, and uh, we need to somehow enable that. Uh, well, fortunately, uh, there is this concept of an initialization method that the OS ACPI interpreter has to run. So on the example on the right, you can see that that's kind of what we did, right? We defined an operation region, which is just a way by which um, ACPI bytecode can do IO uh, to system memory in this case. And uh, we just go and we blast the right, uh, the right, right into that field and make sure that 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 sets the command register for the device to make sure it, it can do DMA. And the, this CRS stuff, that's just how uh, resources are reported to the operating system. So here you see where you find uh, a range which corresponds to the, uh, the one bar that the USB controller has. And we define the interrupt which corresponds to the level interrupt uh, int A for the PCI Express device. Okay, well, that will make USB work uh, on a one gig board and a two gig board. So what about a three gig board? Um, sorry, a four gig board. Well, that's where you have to this problem with, with uh, how do you describe the DMA range. In, in device tree, that's an easy way to do it. In ACPI, there is one as well. Uh, and uh, what you, the way you do it is you take your uh, USB object, uh, USB controller object, and you nest it under another uh, bus controller object. Uh, in this case, it has this uh, funky hover ID of ACPI 0004. It's a container device. And container device devices can have DMA resources. And a DMA resource is what can do the remapping or provide the custom range. So it's in a spec, right? But the ACPI spec is pretty large. Not everything in the spec is actually implemented by, uh, by folks. Um, in particular, uh, in Linux, um, there's no support for this outside of some corn case for uh, the PCI Express root complex and how it integrates with the ACPI. Uh, thanks to Jared McNeil, uh, NetBSD is probably the first OS on the planet to properly decode and support this. Um, and Jared went all the way and not just made uh, the limits work, but made translation work as well. So all those legacy devices that I kept talking about that have the only one gig limit and, and, and then have the three gigabyte translation. Yeah, those work in NetBSD as well. Um, there was like a fine line pa patch to Linux um, that seemed like it could make USB mass storage work, but there's probably more work still necessary there. Um, either to enable some kind of bounce buffering or to properly propagate um, the DMA limits um, because other USB devices like HID or on networking didn't work with basic control transfers failing, Im implying that the wrong addresses were being passed around. Okay, um, as far as Windows, my understanding is Windows doesn't support DMA resources either. Okay, so kind of in light of this, we did introduce this kind of ACPI boot profile that limits useful RAM to three gigs. You can turn this off and get full, your full four gigs back, but if you boot an OS that doesn't support, yeah, you can you can you can cap your RAM to three gigabytes. It's not ideal, but it, it's something. Well, what if you don't have a Raspberry Pi four? Uh, can you enjoy this UEFI party and, and and do interesting things and use this as a development for UEFI maybe, uh, development for UEFI bootloaders applications? Yes, you can, right? Uh, maybe you want to be able to use Pixie booting uh, or use iPixie, um, but um, don't have a Raspberry Pi 4. So the good news is, again, like we mentioned, we still make Raspberry Pi 3 releases. We still actively maintain that code because it really is the same code as the Raspberry Pi 4. And actually very recently, um, I added support for both Raspberry Pi 2, the 64-bit uh, variant of that. Um, yes, there was one. It's a revision of 1.2. They basically ran out of the 32-bit chips and they started putting the 64-bit ones on. Uh, so that's the Pi 2 Model B Rev 1.2. Uh, also, uh, Compute Module 3, um, 3 Plus should work as well. And of course, the diminutive uh, Model 3A Plus with only half a gig of RAM. Um, all of these uh, are supported with the Raspberry Pi 3 image. Whew, okay, now um, a brief demo. Um, here's some funny stack, static pictures. That's Windows uh, booting all the way to setup, but of course no input. But folks have actually managed to um, uh, use 
the USB controller driver for, from the Raspberry Pi 3, uh, that's on the Type-C for the Raspberry Pi 4. As long as you kept the RAM to 1 gig, you can actually get a, f a fairly decent uh, Windows experience. Um, here you see a, a development screenshot of ESXi running on the Raspberry Pi 4. Um, and of course, some pictures of functionality like uh, working PCI Express inside UEFI, enumerating the USB controller. Okay. But here, what I have here, I can show you real OpenBSD, um, sorry, uh, booting um, on, um, of course, the, uh, the Raspberry Pi 4. So let's take a look at that. So this, uh, I believe, is actually booting using uh, device tree mode, um, which... Uh, OpenBSD actually supports booting using both the device tree and a CPI. And uh, what I'm going to show you is, is both, both ways. So I will show you it booting up into OpenBSD, and then I will log in and I will reboot. And uh, we're going to set it to, to boot in the other mode, and we'll see it boot again. Um, OpenBSD is the only OS today that's capable of this feat uh, on the Raspberry Pi 4. Uh, although NetBSD should be, uh, it should be possible on, on, with NetBSD as well. So I'll, allow me to log in. Okay, so just in case, this is all fake. It's not ARM64, OpenBSD. All right, let's reboot. It's funny how if you're not showing a demo, it feels like it's much faster. So I'm going to mash the escape key to get into the UEFI setup. Here I am. All right, so this is pretty normal for Tano Core. Um, what can we do here? We can set the console preference. Um, serial means that if I had a serial dongle connected, then the serial port would be exposed over ACPI as well. Uh, you can set it to graphical. Uh, in which case you will not get a serial port available to you that way, and you will not be able to interact with it with serial. Uh, a booted ACPI OS. Uh, you can do RAM disk. Uh, Raspberry Pi configuration is where some, some of the interesting stuff is. You can set the uh, CPU clock rate here, right? The default would be like 1500. Max, I guess, is the max that you can do. Um, display. Um, this uses basically this concept of virtual resolutions. So in this case, I set it to 800 by 600 just so you can have a, a decent picture. Usually it's only set the native resolution and then you'll just see whatever the native resolution is. This actually works the other way uh, back too. So let's say you have your Raspberry Pi 4 connected to a, like a TV using SDTV. Um, you can pretend that you have 1080p. Right, even though you don't, right? You'll get a very fuzzy picture, but it, so it can scale up and scale down, but it's still better than nothing. Okay, uh, let's not mess with that. But advanced config is here. This is where you could set the limit to three gigabytes, right? I don't, I want the full four gigs. And this is where the system table selection, right now it was set to device tree. So only device tree was exposed to the OS. I can expose both and let the OS figure out which one it wants to use. Um, let's set it to ACPI, okay. Uh, there's some options around like uh, some debugging settings for the SD host controller. Um, again, some debugging options available if you want to play around with it. Okay, so yes, we want to save. Um, configuration for iSCSI, network device list. This is where you can set up HTTP boot, right? Very cool. Uh, this is using the GNET onboard uh, SOC. NIC, okay. So we're going to have to reboot, have to reset to apply the new settings. And now let's boot OpenBSD again. And now we see that it's actually using ACPI, right? So it's booting exactly using ACPI. Um, you get the same experience, right? Uh, you get working USB. Uh, you get, um, I, I believe in ACPI mode, it doesn't support the host controller yet. But these are, these are just details, right? Uh, okay. Um, 
So now I guess is the call to action. Uh, like I mentioned, uh, it would be fantastic to have more devices, uh, device bindings for um, the Raspberry Pi 4 using ACPI way of bindings, like GPO controllers, I2C, SPI, that thing, right? We have the devices exposed, but folks need to adjust the drivers. Uh, we're looking for more help on the UE5 firmware front. There's always things to do. Uh, we want to support the new SD host controller. Um, we would like to make the, the firmware um, kind of configure itself using the device tree that's passed by the GPU firmware, for example. Uh, hang out with us on our Discord uh, server channel. Ask us questions. We'll help you get your OS up uh, if it's not running yet. Uh, we've had NetBSD, OpenBSD developers hang out there, some FreeBSD developers as well. Um, if you're welcome to contact me directly on email. You can also uh, contact my uh, ARM uh, counterpart. His name is Summer El Haj Mahmoud. He's a uh, principal. Uh, um, at ARM focusing on standards. Now, Raspberry Pis are great, that's cool, but there are other interesting platforms. Obviously, NVIDIA being a, um, a high-end platform, it would be fantastic to make that thing standards compliant, right? Um, also, uh, Rockchip-based platforms, because they're so well-documented, you get the documentation available uh, without an NDA. Uh, Pinebook Pro uses the RK3399. It would be amazing to uh, have uh, a standards compliant laptop. Uh, I actually have a work in progress uh, UEFI implementation for um, for the for the RK3399, but unfortunately I, I have very limited resources. Uh, I'm not working on that right now. Uh, UEFI doesn't have to be Tiano Core. Tiano Core, of course, is the BSD license implementation that is now a community project and was started by Intel. But that's Yeboot, and I'm sure there's other implementations out there as well. Let's make them all uh, work with ACPI expose the CPI to the OS. Um, for those of you not on this, please join the ARM Server Advisory Council. Reach out to me uh, if you would like your OS uh, to be represented there uh, or if you want your silicon vendor provider be exp uh, represented there and you're not yet and I'll connect you to the right folks. Uh, yeah, let's work together. Let's shape the uh, the standards uh, and the requirements for non-server uh, systems, right? Clearly, a lot uh, there's a lot of overlap with servers, but there's there's things that, that have to be solved, right? Okay, so uh, thanks a lot for your time, and I'm uh, looking forward uh, to your uh, to your questions. Thank you.